Hello and welcome to this video lecture on employee selection. Of all the various HRM activities or functions, selection just might be the most important. If you cannot find and hire the best people for the job, then it doesn't matter how much you compensate them or train them or protect their various rights in the workplace, etc. None of that matters until they are selected for hire. Let's get started. HR professionals spend a ton of time on finding and hiring the right people. They are always on the lookout for good candidates for employment or promotion. To a great extent, they're constantly looking to match people to jobs. It's sort of a noble calling. HR selection is the process of choosing individuals who have relevant qualifications to fill existing or projected job openings. The main overarching goal of selection and selection testing is to predict job performance. Sounds simple, huh? Not really. It can be very difficult if you have a fear of math. Testing requires a knowledge of measurement, scoring, and statistics. So we administer tests to predict job performance. A test is an objective and standardized measure of a sample of behavior that is used to gauge a person's knowledge, skills, abilities, and other characteristics in relation to other individuals. As we know from Griggs v. Duke Power, all tests must be job related. We have to think of a test as any decision made about the applicant. The submission of a resume is a test. The test is whether the resume goes into the yes, no, or the maybe stack. An interview is a test. Applicants are scored on their performance in an interview, and those scores should be strongly positively correlated with later job performance. The best selection tests are standardized in that they are as objective as possible and the same test is given to every applicant. Again, the test must measure KSAOs that are germane to the job. As an aside, many people claim they are not good at standardized tests. That's hogwash. 99.9% .9 of all tests that anyone has ever taken are standardized. A multiple choice test administered in a classroom is standardized. The LSAT and GMAT are standardized. Standardization simply means that everyone gets the same questions, or at least the questions are drawn from the same bank. Every question is consistently scored as correct or incorrect. And to the extent possible, the testing conditions are the same for everyone. That's a standardized test. There are a couple of fit considerations to think about in testing applicants for jobs. The first is person job fit, where we try and match the applicant's KSAOs to the requirements of the job. The other is person organization fit, which is the degree to which the applicant fits in well with the culture of the organization. For example, if an applicant has no history nor an interest in teamwork and close collaboration and the company thrives on that, seeks employees who value it and knows that their best ideas come from teamwork, then that applicant might have low PO fit. You might think that PO or person organization fit is sort of subjective, but there are ways of measuring the values of current employees and those of job applicants. It's not rocket science, but it is science. Let's move on. Reliability is the dependency or consistency of scores on a test over time or between raters. Reliability is a necessary but not sufficient condition for validity, which we'll cover on the next slide. Think of reliability as a sort of accuracy. If one places a rifle in a vise and aims it smack at the bull's eye, but each shot ends up in a very different part of the target, the rifle may not be reliable if one shot ends up on the top right and another on the bottom left and the others are scattered everywhere in between except the bull's eye. Think of a bathroom scale that reads 175 pounds at 8 a.m. and 160 at 8.05 and 200 at 8.10. Both the rifle and the scale are unreliable. We cannot depend upon the accuracy of scores or numbers on that test, with the test being the rifle in the vise and the bathroom scale, neither of which are consistent or reliable. There are several types of reliability. 
The first is known as parallel forms, which is sometimes called alternative forms reliability. This is computed as the correlation between two versions of the same test given to every applicant. The Wunderlich test of cognitive ability has both form A and form B. The scientists at Wunderlich have worked hard so that both forms yield incredibly similar skulls. It does not matter if you get form A or form B. Your score will be reliably similar on either form. The second is split halves reliability, which is simply the correlation between scores on one half of the test and scores on the other half. Commonly, we think of it as front half correlated with back half. However, this correlation may sometimes be artificially deflated because of fatigue. That is, when test takers get towards the end of a test, they tend to perform worse because they're tired. So correlating front half scores with back half scores is usually ill-advised. It's better to do split halves reliability by examining the correlation between all even-numbered test items and all odd-numbered test items. This reliability coefficient essentially examines how well the various parts of a test measure the same thing, which is a good thing. The third type of reliability is a specialized case of split halves reliability and is known as internal consistency reliability. With internal consistency, we essentially examine all possible pairs of test items. It's sort of an average inter-item correlation. If we have, say, five items on the test, there are 10 possible unique pairs of items because the number of unique pairs is equal to n times n minus 1 divided by 2 for an n item length test. The two main subtypes of internal consistency are for different types of test questions. For questions that, that have a range of responses, like a personality test that uses a 1 to 5 Likert response scale, we calculate Kronbach's coefficient alpha. For tests with dichotomously scored items, like true-false questions, or even multiple choice questions, where there is actually only one correct answer and all of the other options are incorrect, we calculate the KR20. Cooter and Richardson developed over 90 different formulae for special cases of internal consistency. The KR20 is for dichotomous items. The fourth type of reliability is test-retest reliability. If we expect that no learning from test administrations at time one to time two, then the correlation between those two test scores should be very, very strong and positive. If we expect some change in the thing being measured over that time span, then the correlation should not be so strong and positive. Attitudes, for example, tend to vacillate over time, so the test-retest reliability for attitudes tends not to be so strong as something more immutable like IQ. Intelligence does not change much over time, so the test-retest reliability should be near perfect to 1.0. The fifth type of reliability is inter-rater reliability and its close cousin inter-rater agreement. Both try to measure the degree of similarity of raters' scores on an applicant's answers to questions. It should be high if the raters are properly trained, that's critical, and the questions being scored have a proper scoring rubric, that's critical too. Calculation of inter-rater reliability often involves complex calculations using the intra-class correlation coefficient, but inter-rater agreement is usually just a percentage agreement, which is really kind of easy to calculate. Let's move on. What is validity? Validity is the relationship between scores and the thing the scores measure. 
a bathroom scale is usually a valid measure of body weight. More specifically, the number of pounds that are shown when you get on the scale is a valid measure of body weight. If the body weight scale suddenly says six foot four, then those scores are not valid indicators of body weight. And you should probably seek a refund for the scale that you purchased. Construct validity is the extent to which a selection tool measures a theoretical construct or a trait. One can think of construct validity as the overarching or encompassing form of validity. One type of construct validity is convergent validity and its polar opposite, discriminant validity. Think, for example, of two different personality tests given to job applicants that both measure conscientiousness. Test A might also measure attitudes towards teamwork, and test B might also measure job knowledge. If the two tests of conscientiousness show evidence of convergent validity, then the correlation between them should be strong and positive, and much different from the correlation between attitudes towards teamwork and job knowledge. Discriminative validity is when two tests show a low correlation between them because they measure two different things. Again, like attitudes towards teamwork and job knowledge, or between attitudes towards teamwork and conscientiousness. The correlations between scores on these two very different tests should be low and weak because the tests measure different things. Content validity is the extent to which a selection instrument, such as a test, adequately samples the knowledge and skills needed to perform a particular job. When developing a selection test, it's important to cover all aspects of the job and not to cover things that are not germane to the job. Content validity is usually a judgment call. Criterion-related validity is the extent to which a selection tool predicts or significantly correlates with important elements of work behavior. This is the gold standard of selection testing. It answers the questions, do scores on this test correlate strongly with scores on performance? Thus, it seeks to measure the strength of the relationship between some predictor and some criterion. There are two subtypes of criterion-related validity. The first subtype is concurrent validity, which is the extent to which test scores or other predictor information match criterion data obtained at about the same time from current employees. So here the predictor scores and the criterion scores are collected concurrently and it therefore requires that the selection test be administered to current employees. This is usually a very important step in the selection test validation procedure. You cannot use a test for selection of applicants until you prove the scores on it correlate strongly with performance scores. The second subtype is predictive validity. This is the extent to which applicants' test scores match criterion scores obtained from those applicants or employees after they have been on the job for some indefinite period of time. With predictive validity, we are trying to show that selection test scores at time A predict job performance scores at time B, which is later on. Validity generalization is something altogether different. It is the extent to which validity coefficients can be generalized across situations. So there is no need to engage in test validation if the test has been shown to be predictive of performance in some other similar sample for a similar job. If a scientifically validated and well-used personality test has been shown to predict job performance in most jobs by virtue of a validity generalization, then go ahead and use the test. It's been proven, so it's good. Validity generalization is conducted with meta-analysis. So a good HR person should scan the academic databases for published meta-analyses that examine selection tests. Let's move on.
Each of these on this slide is a test. Every one of them must be scored. Something on which a score is systematically assigned is a test, and scores for applicants are compared. There are numerous ways to collect information on job applicants. Some are better than others in predicting job performance. Every pre-hire bit of data should be collected with the purpose of predicting job performance later if the applicant is hired. We'll talk extensively about some of these. One of these is a lie detector test, also known as a polygraph test. These are only allowed for certain jobs because they are notoriously unreliable. This means that a lie detector test interpreted by two different examiners could result in different scores. And scores on two different lie detector tests of the same applicant could be wildly different. Selection tests should be ultra reliable. We're making important decisions based upon their scores. These tests each has a price or a cost associated with it. An application form is really cheap, but you still have to pay someone to review and score it. That's a cost. Background checks can be expensive depending on how in-depth they are. If, for example, you are applying for a job with the Department of Defense, the FBI, Secret Service, or any government job that requires high level of security clearance, they will send someone to interview all of your professors. Not just the ones that you list, but they will get your transcript and make appointments to meet with each and every one. I have been interviewed by such persons many times about my former students. All of my comments were truthful and some were painful. If you know what I mean. Interviews are terrifically expensive because the questions must be job related, the questions must be developed, they must be administered, and they must be scored. That's one reason why an interview usually comes near the end of the selection process. That is, many companies use the cheap tests first and save the expensive ones if the candidate makes it to the end of the selection process. We'll also skip a few of these tests in the interest of time, but here they are. Medical exams are tests of one's health and fitness for duty. It is illegal to administer a medical exam until after a job offer has been formally provided. One can fail the exam and the offer can then be retracted, but laws such as the Pregnancy Discrimination Act, the Americans with Disabilities Act, the Vocational Rehabilitation Act, and others protect the rights of applicants in the hiring process. However, there is one test on this list that we absolutely must avoid. Graphology. This is the analysis of handwriting and has been shown meta-analytically by synthesizing scores of primary studies of handwriting analysis. It has been shown to be pure and absolute bunk. They predict nothing. They are as useful as tarot cards, astrology, and palm reading. However, oddly, in some parts of France, graphology is still used. Crazy French people. Let's move on. The Employee Polygraph Protection Act of 1988 allows lie detector tests only in occupations that require the handling of firearms, large amounts of money, and pharmaceuticals. In most other occupations, they are illegal. However, if you had a job before 1988, the chances are good that you took a polygraph test. I did. The person administering the test must be a qualified examiner, and the law requires that the firm to which one is applying disclose how the information obtained in the test will be used. Because these sorts of tests are prohibited in most jobs, and because they are notoriously unreliable, most employers use paper and pencil honesty and integrity tests. Some of these sorts of tests are overt in that they ask you about your past experiences with dishonesty and your attitudes towards coworkers who engage in dishonest acts. The covert type of integrity test asks questions about one's personality 
and some traits are indeed strongly correlated with honest behavior. These sorts of tests are not so in your face about what they are asking, and they tend to be less predisposed towards impression management or faking or lying, as well as being much more palatable to applicants. Let's move on. One of the most reliable and valid tests used for employment is a cognitive ability test. In fact, cognitive ability is the strongest predictor of job performance in all jobs and using any way of measuring job performance from assembly line widget production to new clients obtained by lawyers to a complex assessment of performance for managers. It's number one. A cognitive ability test is an examination or measurement of one's intelligence level. The reason that a cognitive ability test is the absolute best test that we can use to predict job performance is because smart people learn more about a job than not so smart people. And that job knowledge then translates into job performance. Such tests cover abilities like verbal comprehension, numerical ability, spatial visualization, symbolic reasoning, etc. Some common examples of intelligence tests include the Wunderlich Personnel Test, the Weschler Test, and the very famous Stanford Binet IQ Test. Some of the advantages of an IQ test is that the scores are highly reliable. These sorts of tests have been developed and refined over the course of 100 plus years. The kinks have been worked out and they provide consistent, dependable, and accurate scores of intelligence. Other advantages include the fact that scores on verbal reasoning and numerical ability subtest are highly valid for some jobs. Think for a minute about the job of financial analyst. It stands to reason that such positions require high levels of numerical ability. The job of attorney, on the other hand, requires high levels of verbal reasoning. Intelligence as a higher order construct is therefore predictive of performance in both jobs. Similarly, another advantage is that the validity of an intelligence test rises with increasing complexity of the job as illustrated on this graph. That is, higher levels higher level jobs have an even stronger correlation with intelligence. Another advantage is that they may be administered to large groups at the same time, thus lowering costs. On the other hand, there are some disadvantages. Non-minorities typically score one standard deviation higher than some other minorities, and differences between males and females in certain specific abilities or subtest may negatively impact inferences from scores. There is no perfect test, but these tests come really close. Let's move on. Personality tests measure traits that are important to the performance of the job. We have broad-based traits that are usually organized as the big five or the five-factor model. These traits are very broad, but they're useful for predicting broad behaviors like job performance. Think for a second about job performance. It's comprised of task performance, contextual performance, counterproductive work behavior, and other behaviors. Task performance is the list of duties and tasks on the job description. Contextual performance is the little things not on a job description that contribute to the effective performance of the organization, like volunteering for unpaid committee assignments, speaking favorably to outsiders about the company, helping others with the performance of the job when one is finished with their own, etc. It encompasses so many things that we need to match trait level to behavior level. This is called the specificity matching principle. Broad traits are used to predict broad behaviors and narrow traits are used to measure narrow behaviors. The five broad traits of the Big Five are often known by their acronym CANOE or OCEAN. Note that neuroticism is sometimes referred to by its polar opposite of emotional stability. For that matter, extroversion could be known by its polar opposite as well, introversion. It's important to know that of the Big Five, conscientiousness is the strongest predictor of job performance 
of any of the traits on any job, no matter how the performance is measured. Some common personality measures include the International Personality Item Pool, or IPIP, which is freely available on the internet. The others are copyrighted, and therefore they cost money. Some examples of them are the California Psychological Inventory, as well as Costa and McRae's N-E-O-P-I-R. <laughs> That's a mouthful. Please note that a commonly used diagnostic inventory known as the Minnesota Multiphasic Personality Inventory, the MMPI, is now illegal for job applicants. That's because it's likely a violation of the ADA, because the MMPI was designed to diagnose pathological disorders. Yes, it measures personality, but technically it measures clinical pathological traits which are used to diagnose psychopathology. If a person suffers from a diagnosed psychological disorder, then they are protected by the ADA. The MMPI is sort of like a medical test, and medical tests cannot be administered until after a formal job offer has been issued. Some advantages of personality tests include lower turnover if the applicants are selected for traits that are correlated with having a long tenure. Additionally, these tests can reveal more information about the applicant's abilities and interests, which helps with placement in roles. Another advantage is that these tests can identify interpersonal traits needed for certain jobs, like extroversion for salespeople. Some disadvantages include that it can be difficult to measure some traits. Also, training and experience may have a greater impact on performance than does personality. Plus, the cost of some personality tests can be prohibitive. Lastly, there is a problem with impression management, which is the overt manipulation of how one is perceived by others. Impression management can rear its ugly head when the applicant can clearly see that the test is measuring conscientiousness and they skew their responses to present themselves more favorably, more conscientiously to the company. Let's move on. A work sample test should be given to an applicant for a job for which job experience is absolutely required. For example, one need have no experience to work the front counter at a fast food restaurant. However, one should be well trained and experienced in welding or finance before being given a job as a welder or financial analyst. This is the best test there is for a job for that narrow category of jobs for which experience is required, which actually isn't as many jobs as you might think. So it provides direct evidence of the applicant's abilities by asking them to perform some of the regular job duties. It's a work sample test. These types of tests range from a simulation of an event, like taking off and landing a jet in a simulation machine, there's no way we can let every applicant actually land a 747 before we give them a job as a pilot. So we'll stick them in a flight simulator and see how well they do the job. We can make applicants for welding jobs actually do some welding, though. A financial analyst test is usually paper and pencil tests, but could involve explaining something sophisticated to a person who is role-playing as a naive customer. There are other verbal work sample tests, like having an attorney give a sample closing argument for a fictitious case, or a professor teach a sample class before getting hired by a university. The biggest downside of this sort of test is that it is usually terrifically expensive. Giving a welder a work sample test involves, say, a pipe, welding equipment, safety equipment, an observer or raider, an x-ray machine to examine the weld, etc. A finance test requires an extensive test development process, usually conducted by a for-profit test company. The items in the finance test must be chosen and scored correctly to not run afoul of Griggs v. Duke Power. Remember that every test must be job-related, or you open yourself up to litigation. Let's move on.
Biographical information blanks are also known as, aka, biodata. Same thing. They're very different than a simple application form, but they also require the completion of requests for some personal information about one's life. The biodata instrument asks about events, interests, and experiences in an applicant's past or their biography. We know that the best predictor of future behavior is past behavior. So we can ask questions that dig deeply into one's experience, and numerous scientific studies have shown that the answers to these questions correlate quite nicely with aspects of job performance. For example, look at this third question in this very abbreviated list. Did you ever build a model airplane that actually flew? Affirmative answers to this might include or indicate an underlying interest in science and mechanics, as well as an attention to detail that building a model airplane that actually flies might require. The next question asks if sports were a big part of your childhood. Most childhood sports teams or sports are actually team-based, but not all of them. If one played basketball, football, soccer, and baseball, it would indicate ample experience in subjugating one's own interests to those of the team, as well as great experience just in teams in general. If one played tennis or golf, it might demonstrate that a single-minded focus on personal excellence isn't bad either. Playing musical instruments takes a lot of dedication. Dedication is important to job performance. Let's move on. Most job interviews are done very poorly. Before we can recommend the best type of interview for most jobs, we need to cover the variety of types. A non-directive interview is one in which the applicant determines the course of the discussion, while the interviewer refrains from influencing the applicant's remarks. This is also known as an unstructured interview, and the questions can differ between all of the applicants. That is, the questions and conversation are not standardized across applicants, making it very hard to score. A structured interview is an interview in which a set of standardized questions having an established set of answers is used. In this type, each applicant gets the same questions and each answer is scored using some predetermined scoring rubric. A situational interview is an interview in which an applicant is given a hypothetical incident and asked how he or she would respond to it. These usually start with the phrase, what would you do if? As you might surmise, they are sort of a test of one's ability to think on their feet and are more likely to be faked in that one can say that one would do what one would do in a factory caught on fire might actually be quite different from what they actually did in the factory fire. The behavioral descriptive interview is an interview in which an applicant is asked questions about what he or she actually did in a given situation. The answers to these are harder to fake because they can often be verified. They usually start with the phrase, tell me about a time when you. A panel interview is an interview in which a board of interviewers ask questions and scores the answers for a single candidate. This is an uber-structured interview. The raters should have strongly correlated scores for each answer, so having three or four raters can allow one to calculate the inter-rater reliability, as well as having almost a 360-degree approach to interview scoring. A computer interview uses a computer program that requires candidates to answer a series of questions tailored to the job. The answers are compared either with an ideal profile or with profiles developed on the basis of other candidates' responses. These are being used more and more, mainly because of their low cost and ease of administration. However, they tend not to allow for nuanced answers for the assessment of nonverbal body language and for the assessment of overall congeniality. On the other hand, video and digitally recorded interviews allow for the capture of facial expressions, 
one's demeanor, and nonverbal posturing by using video conference technologies to record and evaluate job candidates' technical abilities, energy level, appearance, and the like before incurring the cost of a face-to-face -face interview. So what's the best type of interview if cost was of no concern? In my opinion, it's the structured behavioral descriptive interview conducted by a panel with video recording of the interviewer. However, that does tend to get a bit pricey. Let's move on. Well, since I've introduced some of the things that affect raters' scores of interviewees and their responses to questions, let's look at how much some specific things influence the interviewer. Grooming is a huge inter influence on interview score. Only 6% of people say grooming has no influence. 6%. Non-traditional attire is another big loser in the interview. The moral of this story is comb your hair, shine your shoes, press your clothes, and don't show up in a tie-dyed t-shirt. Unless the job is selling incense or skateboards, and then such non-traditional attire might, might not hurt your chances so badly. Non-concealable body piercings and obvious tattoos are still a big no-no in most jobs. In a perfect world, we would all be judged solely on our ability to perform the job and on what's inside our character. But the world isn't perfect, and if we want to succeed in it, we need to conform to the world most of the time. At home, put your nose ring in, uncover your tattoo, Go barefoot all you want and wear your tie-dyed t-shirt. But wait until after the interview, please. Let's move on. Given the multitude of tests that we administer to job applicants, all of which should provide us with insight into how well the applicant do, can do the job, we need to give some thought on using that information. Specifically, we need to determine what sort of selection model we'll use. A compensatory model is one model that permits a high score in one area to make up for or compensate for a low score in another area. So an applicant with a not quite genius IQ, but a great personality and a moderate interview score might end up with an overall score that meets some predetermined cutoff. A compensatory model allows high scores in one area to compensate for low scores in another. Of course, to get the overall score, all applicants have to be given all of the test, which could be quite expensive, depending on the number of open positions and the number of applicants. The multiple cutoff model requires that an applicant achieve a minimum score on all selection tests. So we might require an IQ of 110, a conscientiousness score of five out of seven, and an interview score of eight out of 10. This too requires that all applicants be given all tests, but it has the advantage of disqualifying an applicant that scores below some cutoff score on any given test. The test must measure vital competencies, and the premise is that failure on any one of them will doom the applicant to performance failure if they get the job. The multiple hurdle model, on the other hand, requires that only those applicants with sufficiently high scores at each selection stage go on to subsequent stages in the selection process. In this approach to selection, if an applicant doesn't earn a score on the IQ test of 110, then they do not get to take the personality test nor the job interview. We usually arrange these tests from easiest to administer and or least expensive to most difficult to administer and or most expensive. So think about this. If you had only the following five tests, in what order would you arrange them if you used a multiple hurdle approach? The tests are reference checks, work sample, structured interview, personality test, and application blanks. There may not be a perfect answer because all jobs don't require the same test and because some firms have access to more resources than others. 
These five tests might be administered in different order by different companies. But just think about it. Let's move on. Selection for international assignments depends largely on the international approach to selection. If a company uses an ethnocentric approach to placing parent country nationals in overseas assignments, the selection procedure may be very different than a geocentric approach using host country or third country nationals. When trying to select for overseas assignments, more than just the prediction of job performance is necessary. Companies should also assess tolerance for ambiguity, empathy, non-judgmentalism, flexibility, and learning orientation. These can be tested with paper and pencil test, bio data, and interviews. Interviews may sometimes include some role play. In the early stages of a firm's overseas efforts, it might be a bit of a guessing game on what should be tested, but with time, scores on tests can be correlated with performance scores and companies can determine which tests work and which might need some improvement or even need to be discarded. The main reason for expatriate failure, which is defined as leaving an overseas post earlier than intended, is spousal maladaptation. Children are fairly amenable to living overseas, but if the spouse isn't happy, the assignment is doomed. This is amplified if the spouse has a successful career in America. Companies may find it useful to engage in inter-firm networking with overseas clients and partners, provide job hunting assistance to spouses, and give on-assignment career support to both the employee and their spouse. When a parent country national returns from an overseas assignment, they become an expatriate. Expats may find it difficult to reassimilate in the U.S. if they have been abroad for a long time. If they have been away for many years, the old adage of out of sight, out of mind may apply, and they might have been overlooked for promotions that they might have earned if they had stayed in the U.S. However, a psychological contract must be fulfilled when the expat returns, such that new opportunities for the expat exist at home, and the firm is able to show that it actually values the employee. Depending upon the length of time serving abroad and the culture of the host country, re-assimilation can be difficult and firms must have an assimilation policy where they provide help adjusting to their home country after serving many years abroad. Let's move on. Well, thanks. That's all for now.